Welcome to The In Chamber, the place where you focus on the issues and people that shape business success. I'm your co-host, Rebecca Patrick. I'm the Senior Vice President of Communications for the Indiana Chamber of Commerce. Joining me at the microphone is Anthony Shutley, our Director of Communications. In Chamber is presented by the Talent Resource Navigator. Today, we're chatting with Carrie Binko, Executive Vice President at Crown Technology, a family-owned and operated specialty chemical manufacturer serving the steel industry. The company is headquartered in Indianapolis and has been in business for over 75 years. Carrie is here to tell us more about this Hoosier success story and to specifically talk about what it and many other Hoosier companies do, export their products. Carrie, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. First off, Carrie, tell us a little more about what Crown Technology does and your role at the company. I believe you've been there since 1997. That's correct. So we started in 1946, uh, my grandfather and uh, my actual father is still involved uh, in some capacity. And so I'm the third generation and we've um, been at this location for over 30 years and it's great crossroads of America location. We're right on the interstate, uh, which makes distribution very easy. And we um, are somewhat of a niche producer. We're in the chemical business. Most of our products on that side are for the steel industry, steel and wire industry. So it helps with the pickling of steel. So again, great location for Northern Indiana, uh, those different plants. And the other side of our business is ferrous sulfate, which is an iron supplement. So there's both a technical grade and a food grade. Technical grade is used in things like fertilizer and water treatment. And the food grade is actually a nutritional supplement, which is used in premixes of for flour and uh, nutritional supplements. So it's kind of, we're a small company, but we're pretty diverse. Yeah, and real quickly, if you could just tell our listeners what the pickling of steel, in brief, what that is. So imagine the big steel coil sitting out in the yard, they get scale rust, as you might know it, um, they have to be pickled off to get to the surface of the steel. So our chemicals help aid in that process in a couple capacities. Um, it inhibits the scale, uh, the, the acid attacking the steel. So it helps with their acid consumption. I mean, imagine these big, huge pits out outside in the yard, they're open, open air. And you can imagine the amount of acid that they use. So our chemicals help with the inhibition uh, of that product and also as a rinse aid to help prevent additional scale growth. At what point in the company's history was there like an opportunity that turned Crown Technology from really maybe a more domestic business to an international business? When did that happen and how did that come about? That I would say happened probably in the early 90s. Um, We started out with Mexico and Canada because of their location and ease of travel. Um, There weren't language barriers and um, that was really the start. Um, similar industries in those countries that were pickling steel, that was our main niche business. We didn't add the, the iron until later. So really just looking for new opportunities that were achievable with the staff that we had. Very obviously, the company doesn't stay in business for 75 plus years without seeing a ton of change over the years. Um, you know, technology, uh, for one, had, had to be a, a massive, um, you know, issue to deal with. So I'm wondering... How has the exporting side of the business evolved to where it is today? Um, you know, it's it's gotten better. I mean, when we started, there wasn't even really the internet. Um, I guess the biggest change for us is people being able to find us from other countries where we may not be traveling to every country. Um, we our, our, Most of our growth has been uh, them finding us. So I would say those resources have, have helped the most. So how have um, companies in other countries found you guys? Uh, Trade shows, um, search engine optimization is definitely, uh, we get a lot of directed uh, contact, contact, um, you know, just searching, you know, our our iron business is a commodity. um, So anyone looking for that product is going to find us. We're, We're one of the very few producers in this country. And from what we found, they've been drawn to us because of, because of our quality. We have a very high inventory turnover. So they're getting fresh product and um, they're just not maybe finding the the quality or the availability in their other countries. It's interesting to me when you you start thinking about a, a a company that started right here in Indiana and is, is, is kind of homegrown and is run by, you know, generations of families. 
and and you start to think about that com- that company branching out globally and I, and I want to ask you you know what countries you're you're exporting to but but you know people think of countries almost as as things so to say but you're obviously dealing with lots of people and lots of different cultures so tell me what countries or some of the countries where you guys export into where your company exports to and any insights or cultural stories to share along the way Sure. Um, we've grown. I made a list. Uh, we, we're exporting to 14 different countries right now. Um, the biggest other than Mexico probably being uh, China, um, Africa, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Colombia, um, France, Great Britain, India, uh, Malaysia, Mauritania. Um, you know, I, I pondered the question about cultural differences and we've been pretty fortunate. I mean, being in America, almost everyone we've encountered that has not been a language barrier. Um, They uh, have been equally as receptive. You know, I was kind of thinking about what their side might be purchasing from somebody here. And it's been seamless. It it is really, uh, maybe we're just fortunate enough to find these open receptive buyers, but um, they've been excited to deal with an American company for sure. Well, I'm I'm just kind of curious real quick. um, You talk about the language barrier, do most of the companies or representatives of those companies speak English using yes. Google Translate or? Uh, you know, that's possible <laughs> these days that, that it's entirely possible. Uh, but yeah, we, we've been able to converse in English with, with all of our customers. I was curious, Carrie, about, um, you mentioned the products, the pickling and the iron. Uh, is there a certain one that you do more in terms of the exporting? You know, the, the pickling is, has, uh, we've gotten, uh, you know, a few years ago, we brought on uh, an international representative to help us expand our sales. They've been working in that capacity. Um, the food grade iron is definitely one of our um, highest exports, just again, because availability of that niche product, because it's it's not a, a highly available product. You mentioned earlier about you started out sort of with our neighbors in Canada and Mexico doing some of the exporting, would you really say if someone's maybe looking to start the exporting opportunities to, to not forget about those closest to us? Sometimes we think about exporting, we think of, you know, beyond the pond, so to say. Absolutely. I mean, for us starting in those two countries, those, those accounts needed personal visits. They needed some more um, hands-on attention, if you will. Our other countries are more drop shipments, so they don't need post delivery services. So they don't need somebody managing their inventory or teaching them how to um, use the products. They already know what the use is and, and it might have their own purpose for for those products. What impact has exporting had on the company's revenue? I imagine it may have taken it from a certain level to, you know, maybe maybe the next in terms of you know, I don't know if it's employee size or just what the company had to offer. Absolutely. So we've continued to see growth um, every single year, um, even especially since COVID. Um, Right now, our international sales make up 15% of our total revenue, and we're projecting that to grow to 20 this year. Um, And again, we've we've had a new focus in the last three or four years trying to expand um, our targets there. Do you have a specific, is there like a sort of far-reaching goal of how much you think or would like um, the exporting, the international part of the business to be? Well, everyone wants to see exponential growth. Um, you know, I, we just feel like there's so much opportunity because so much of what we have right now is people finding us other than, you know, the ones that we've been easily able to travel to. So, you know, with just a little bit more effort, we think we could really expand, continue to expand our base because, there's just so much opportunity out there. There's, you know, when I think about our steel division, there's so many more countries that have exponentially larger steel production than uh, than the U.S. does. And um, we haven't been able to nearly tap all those different markets. Mary, what are the biggest markets, if I could ask, of your export markets? Uh, d- different steel producers, definitely across the globe. And then, like I said, our food grade iron product, uh, which is used in uh, food production and supplements. Where, where you get, what countries are, you, are is the most business occurring on the export side? Uh, I would say um, Mexico China, and China are top two. And m- most recently, we've had a lot more interest in Africa as well. Africa, that's, that's one I wouldn't have anticipated. 
<laughs> what, what's, what's the need there? What's behind the need there? Just to uh, drop, uh, you know, another little bit of a niche there. Uh, we sell our iron, our technical grade iron product there, and it's actually used in uh, gold mines for leaching gold out of the mines. Um, they have these big cyanide leach fields and they liquefy our ferrous sulfate to help treat that environmentally. And uh, it's a very high use product for that, for that process. Very interesting. Is there any other like very niche um, market or use that you're seeing for some of their products, maybe that unique to one of the other countries? Um, you know, that one might be the most, most unique, um, like I said, the, the fair sulfate is a, is a supplement ingredient. So that's being used in different, uh, mostly flour mixes for food supplements. Um, and then the chemicals are again, mostly in steel mills, same, same process here. Um, pickling of steel has not changed very much over the decades. Uh, lucky for us, they, they, uh, still do it kind of the same old way and, uh, they need to have that steel protection. So, um, and it's, you know, uh, there's different products that they could use, but again, um, availability and supply chain has definitely helped us in these last few years expand in other countries. Just for reference, are there a lot of other companies that do maybe exactly what you maybe do the pickling, but do they do that? Do they do the iron or do you have a lot of competitors in some of, for some of the not, global Not that are doing both. Yeah. Sorry. Not, not that are doing both. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely a niche there because it's, it's those two pro processes are uh, very closely intertwined. So different wire mills will actually produce that fair sulfate product that we reprocess and package and resell. Now a quick word about our sponsor. The Talent Resource Navigator is a new free online tool that offers the convenience of one-stop shopping for education and job training opportunities. Supported by on-demand customer service and technical assistance, the Navigator intentionally guides and connects individuals and employers with a tailored set of talent development resources based on each user's identified needs. Details at talentresourcenavigator.com. Carrie, I have to confess, uh, before our conversation today, I had to do a little research on the Export Import Bank of the United States, or XM. And so I wanted to ask you, what part does the Export Import Bank of the United States, or XM, play in your business and assisting with your exports? Uh, the Export Import Bank has been a very valuable resource for us. Um, that was one of our concerns at the beginning was credit insurance. I know in the beginning we were doing letters of credit, which they haven't gotten any easier um, to, to deal with those. There, there's a lot involved with those. And we were having business opportunities, but we wanted to feel safe. Obviously, sales don't matter unless you're going to get paid. And the thought of trying to collect in another country, um, you know, all, all that kind of credit risk uh, was a big uncertainty. So we found Export Import Bank very early on and partnered with them. And it's quite honestly, taking that financial risk out of the equation for us. It's made it very easy for us to qualify new buyers quickly, um, not make that process harder than it needs to be. And we can focus just on the logistics part, getting them the product that they need. And did you find help from any local Indiana resources to get started? Any, any, uh, any other Indiana businesses you would recommend? Um, for exporting, you know, we do rely on, um, different freight brokers to help with that process. Uh, you know, as you can imagine, the, the, the biggest difference in exporting is that shipping paperwork. What are the requirements that different countries have to import your products? Um, so freight brokers are definitely a valuable asset to us to help understand what those requirements are, get that paperwork completed. And, you know, some of them, uh, we're still FedExing uh, hand paperwork, hand signed paperwork to different countries, um, things like that. So, and other than that, um, you know, I can't identify any specific Indiana businesses, but trade shows that come into town, um, things like that. But we haven't really had any other needs there. I'm, I'm kind of curious. One last thing um, I, I just wanted to ask about the export side. You know, some of the things that you had mentioned had kind of um, 
Well, I wouldn't have thought of, I'm, I'm a writer, I'm not in business. And so you probably thought of those things like, like collections and how challenging that could be uh, across countries. I'm wondering if there are any, any other uh, elements of the export side of it that uh, I don't want to say surprise you, but you guys had to kind of um, deal with along the way that maybe you hadn't expected. Yes. Um, again, the, the paperwork requirements, what what do these countries need to actually export or to import our products? Because the last thing we want is for our products to show up at a port and not have any place to go. And we don't want to have to be in charge of, uh, you know, what those fees might be or disposition of the product. So, um, but for us, that's really all that's involved. Uh, you know, once that, that financial piece is out of the equation, it is purely the logistics. And if you partner with the right broker to help that process, um, it, it makes it almost the same as selling to somebody else in a neighboring uh, state. Yeah, I was going to ask you what, you know, one or two things or advice you might give to companies that may be thinking of either ratcheting up their export business or taking that leap and, you know, sharing their, you know, goods worldwide. I mean, Indiana, obviously we make all sorts of things. Right. You know, we even have a competition here at the chamber, the coolest thing made in Indiana, you know, each year. Um, but it sounds like, like you just, you said it very well, that if you have that part of the equation done, it's almost just like selling to your, your neighbor, you know, across town or in another state. Exactly. I think you just have to be confident about what you're doing and realize that uh, you're going to figure it out. We're a little bit more experienced now with adding all these new countries to our to our portfolio, but uh, it's doable. It's again, you know, some of our packaging, like we might have a different language on it or we might have uh, some additional uh, paperwork that they ask for that's in a, that needs to be translated. But those are all workable issues. Um, you know, we, we have found it to be a, a very good partnership with neighboring countries. Good. One thing I want to make sure to get your opinion on is sort of the value of made in the, the made in the USA products, how they are still seen internationally. How would you characterize that? I absolutely think that. Um, I think I alluded to earlier that um, we have a good turn, inventory turn and we're particularly with our iron product, they want the freshest product possible for these ingredients and um, availability too, particularly since COVID supply chain issues still exist and we're able to uh, supply in a timely fashion. And that's, how, that's what they're looking for. How, how Everybody's still trying to get product as quick as they can. And hopefully everyone still sees as American products as well-made and probably among the most trusted Absolutely. Pro products in the world. So tell us what's next for Crown Technology. Any opportunities you're seeing, whether it's with the export business or anything else, and uh, where you may be looking to grow. Our focus really has been international. Um, again, we're we're a little bit niche in domestically, so uh, we added some personnel to help expand uh, globally, and uh, it's it's been it's been going very well. And like I said, we're just trying to explore where are those buyers trying to find people like us. Um, that's always a, a, a challenge because you can't just wait for them to knock on your door. But I will say that when we do get those opportunities knocking, we're much more receptive to that being a, a real potential uh, lead because before you may not, might not have been as, as trusting <laughs> hearing from somebody in that way. But uh, for us, uh, we have a lot more confidence in the whole process. Rebecca, I can't um, I can't let one comment just blow right by without commenting on it uh, that Carrie made when she was talking about freshness of products. We're talking about steel, I think. I, I was thinking that that only applied like in bakery products, but I didn't realize freshness mattered in steel, too, apparently. I'm curious why that is. Why, why freshness of product would. Yeah, I was I was talking about our our food grade iron which is used oh, okay. in, in, in premixes. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So we were talking about food. We were, we I were. Know, I had my mind on steel for some reason. I kept thinking, fresh <laughs> product. why does that matter? So now, now it all makes, now it all makes yeah. sense. Okay. I'm, now I'm, it all makes sense. <laughs> well, Carrie, that's the last question we have. Is there anything else you wanted to say to wrap up here? You know, I just, like I said, we've had a great partnership with Export Import Bank. It, it makes my job easier. Um, and we're able to uh, not have to worry about the payment part. And that's in my business huge because uh, at the end of the day, that's what matters. 
Great. Well, Carrie, thank you again for joining us. Appreciate it. Enjoyed the conversation. In Chamber is presented by the Talent Resource Navigator. As always, thank you for listening. <music>